So welcome everyone. Um, let's see. Let's see if I can get me as the pin. There we go. Um, so welcome everyone. Welcome back. Those who were here yesterday, if you're new, um, welcome to uh, this tutorial session. Um, this is a tutorial session where we're focusing on DDoS resiliency. Um, those things that you need to do to build a resilient network in today's hostile environment. Um, we're going to be doing uh, two hours today. This is going on throughout the week. We're adjusting things. The original order that um, I foresaw, um, kind of like we needed to modify it just to get materials out in case things started flying with packets started flying around with what's happening in Ukraine. Um, that is still an evolving area, so we can expect um, expected unexpected. Um, you never know what's going to happen with that. Um, so, so today um, uh, we'll walk through the session. Um, everybody, um, you're all welcome to uh, um, ask questions throughout. Um, jump on chat, um, raise your hand if I can see it. You can ask question in the middle of the talk, um, and we'll have um, time for uh, questions at the end of the talk too. So we have plenty of time there. So. Build up your questions. The, the Q&A actually adds a lot of good um, insight and knowledge for not only yourself, but for others who are listening in. Um, so uh, please be bold and brave and ask any questions you have. Um, and that will be very helpful to everyone. So what I'm going to do right now is I am going to um, let's make sure we are recording. All good. I'm going to share the screen here. So we'll share it there. OK. And so um, yesterday, as I mentioned, yet um, we I'll just walk through this again. This may be redundant for the people here yesterday, but for the new no ones out here, um, we are doing a little bit of tuning of the materials. Uh, this is, you know, a workshop like like Apricot. We can tune towards the situation and the reality of what's in facing us as operators. Um, and so we're doing a little bit of tweak around because uh, there's a, a big alert to have shields up. Uh, the reason why shields up is whenever there is a geopolitical crisis in the world, there is a, an accompanying cyber crisis. And with the geopolitical crisis, um, your battle space for that crisis is the entire internet. You cannot guarantee that it's going to be contained in one geographic area, uh, like you can contain uh, bullets and missiles and tanks. Um, this, uh, when it goes out onto the internet, that packets start flying all over the place, and you know where you target them with it. So we, we as um, uh, network professionals, systems professionals, um, you know, we need to be vigilant with this. So. Um, if something does happen to your network and this is new, keep, you know, advise to your management. Don't panic. These things happen. We can get through it. Um, you know, trust your team. You know, you don't need to go out there and uh, help for somebody else. You know, you can get the help. You got to work with collaborators, you know, and other peers and other organizations. But your best experts are within your team themselves. Um, and encourage collaborations with your peers, right? Uh, vendors help out. But what I found my personal experience is working with your peers and building those relationships that you've built in a forum like Apricot or APNOG or Nanog or any other, other groups out there are you know, the powerful relationships. And then give your team time to, to actually get the work done, all right? Um, and then I'll just flip through this. These are just supporting slides. You can look through it. Yesterday, we, we did a session that we inserted in that was not originally planned, which is Shields up, where we kind of were walking through one of the advisories and how to read these advisories because we have been getting recent advisories and one uh, from different national C certs, uh, uh, CISA, um, the um, uh, you know Australian authority, and New Zealand authority, UK authority. So when you get when you get alerts like this from different national C certs, uh, they mean something, and we wanted to walk through. Here's how to kind of like look through it. Um, and how we actually you know, um, build up a mitigation plan. Um, and we walk through the uh, NZ CERT model for ransomware lifecycle as an example of that. And then we talk through um, understanding the miscreants, why they're attacking, 
understand behavior patterns, how to use behavior patterns to actually uh, dissuade the attackers and make it harder for them. Right, so we we talked through on that one. Today, uh, what we're going to be going through is um, responding to DDoS attacks, focus on the basic tools, and then um, talking about source address validation in the second hour. You know, and the hard, hard realities of source address validation. So, um, so those are the two uh, modules that we're going to be working on today. So, um, so yeah. So let me go ahead right now and. Um, and then we got more modules coming up over the next couple of days. Uh, some of them, as as um, you might have just heard from Philip and I, I'm tuning from past materials because there's a long history of these materials of what we've been doing. Uh, some of these materials go back to like 94, 95 presentations, right? So this is something that's gone on for quite a long time. So let's let's get in and talk about handling DDoS attacks. Um, if you've been a network professional, um, you probably have been on a network that encountered some sort of DDoS issue. Um, you know, it's so common today. Some people saw, thought it was going to be uncommon, but we get so many of them, primarily because DDoS is part of a criminal enterprise, um, which we talked a little bit about yesterday with the DDoS extortionist. And, you know, there's what, what happens is a lot of organizations, they get hit with a DDoS. And, you know, I see this all the time from like the company I currently work with. We have a DDoS service. And it's really interesting because, you know, people jump in and says, oh, vendor, please save me. And I look at it and I go, there's so much that you can do before you call up a vendor and subscribe to a, what, what I call a a, first, a full DDoS service restoration capability is what, what Akamai does. But there's so many other things you can do to add resilience, uh, build up the techniques and tools, and build up what we would call a um, DDoS toolkit. So you can go through and say, if this situation happens, here's what I do. If this situation, here's what I do, all right? And we'll get a little bit more into this when we talk about playbooks. Right, so this session today is to actually start looking at these tools in the toolbox. So you build up a DDoS toolbox of, of things you can do. Um, I was just putting these as headers in there. All right, so number one, when you do these toolbox, the appropriate tool is based off of the attacker, the person, because remember yesterday, we talked about how it's really, really important that you focus on the human being who's going after you, right? and then what tool they're choosing to use, right? So make, you know, some people say, oh, here, I'm getting hit with a UDP attack. I'm getting hit with a UDP flood. I'm getting a Synac flood, right? It says, okay, good. But who's launching it? Why are they launching it, right? You gotta link the two of them together so you can say, okay, now I'm gonna respond to it with this. You're gonna do a counter. And we call it uh, dancing with the miscreants, right? So you got a miscreant going on there and you start going back and forth with the different toolkits. So this is a session I'm crafting up that will evolve over, over this one, what I call dancing with the miscreants, that actually you, you say, okay, if they do this, then I do this. If they do this, I do this, right? You go back and forth with them with that, right? So that's the idea with this. Uh, this is a slide I found. Um, I'm going to update this. There's a ton of materials out there. I mean, this goes back to a long, long time. So I just put this in there as a reference so you can see reference materials out there. Now, key thing to remember is this, um, how you stop a DOS attack, right? Um, clean pipes, road trigger black holes, scrub and senders, you know, and other anti-DDoS solutions, don't stop DOS attacks. Right, so you go out to a vendor and say, "Hey, I'm going to stop the DOS attack for you." Okay, are you putting handcuffs on somebody? No, I'm. I got a special tool. Okay, but that doesn't stop the DOS attack, and that's a key thing to remember. The tools you can put up there to mitigate the effects of the attack, the tools will help you keep your service up and running. What you call a full service restoration, restoration, right? You can give yourself time to mitigate the attack and get ready but the attack is still going on. There's still a human being out there who launched attack for some reason, right? So, you know, what you're gonna do with this is, you know, you're gonna withstand the attack, get some visibility, put in the remediation tools, back trait and triangulate because the only way you stop an attack is to actually, um, there, there's three, three ways of stopping an attack. Number one, 
um, the attacker tires and stops, all right? Number two, you put the pressure on the attacker where they think they're gonna get caught. So they'll leave to protect themselves. Because remember, principal and miscreant, you know, don't get caught, right? It's number one, don't get caught, right? And number three, they actually put handcuffs on them, right? Like we did with DD4BC, we put handcuffs on them. And all the different attacks from DD4BC uh, disappeared because we put handcuffs on them. This slide I did uh, years ago, and it's interesting how this has evolved into now we got booters and stressors and you've got gamers. Gamers go out there and say, yeah, I'll spend, you know, uh, one Bitcoin or half a Bitcoin or a quarter Bitcoin because of the Bitcoin value. And I'll go out there and DOS my competitors during this tournament, online gaming tournament. You know, it's so easy to actually now um, rent, you know, um, a DDoS attack. And this is why we get these DDoS attacks, which are short lived and bursty and, you know, because they go out there and disrupt. You know, you, you, don't, you know, it's rare to get the, the really persistent ones. And when the persistent ones happen, as we mentioned yesterday in the different cases, the VoIP attacks that happened last year and the attack on uh, uh, New Zealand organizations last year, both of those are very persistent attacks. So those are things to kind of like watch out for. Now, there's some essential principles that we would go through and teach. Number one, you want to set up your network and your system um, so you have complete control. You got to... You know, if you, you hand off control with somebody else has got to, you know, adjust the knobs or adjust the controls, then you're, you're not giving yourself the resiliency options. You got to make sure you have complete control of all, all the different traffic going on the network. You got to maximize your availability. So you got to really think about the availability. And it's really interesting about availability where people just don't think the different scenarios. I'll, I'll give a, a couple of stories here in a minute. And then visibility, you got to have the telemetry, you got to know what's going on. You know, yes, you want login, but in today's uh, DevOps world, you know, your API visibility, the tools you pull up from the different apps, so you can see what's going on. Um, you know, of course, all sorts of flow telemetry, whether it's IP fix, NetFlow, tools like that, those sort of things, right? The visibility is key because you got to understand what's happening to your network. And this becomes complicated. And sometimes you can do it with open source tools. I always advocate when you start your visibility path, Start with the open source tools first. See what they say, here's my scenario. Here's some open source tools I can load up in a cloud service or I can load up into a device in my data center, right? Because what the open source path does when you look at tools like this is it gives you some experience. What you'll probably end up doing is buying something or signing up to a service. You're in a better position to figure out what you need after you've done the open source route. And sometimes, you find that you can combine your open source with a commercial service together and you get it at a cheaper price. You put the combination of them together, right? So when you go through this telemetry, telemetry of understanding what's going on, the visibility of happening out there with a DDoS attacks and stress to the systems and things like that is really, it's the nervous system of understanding it. Control means you need to know exactly what's going on in your network, right? Like, you know, and being able to actually adjust it and, and, and take care of it. There's so many times when something happens, you go, okay, um, I just had a critical dependency just get hit. I had this API, I had my, my data center dependent on this API off net and the API got hit with a DOS attack. Okay, what do I do? Okay, that's the wrong thing. You gotta, that's part of the thing to play out to say, do I have control? If this happens, how do I have resiliency to that connection? Because my business depends where I got customers who call in for one, then I do a call out to the API to get more information. And if that path gets hit, which we've seen, we've seen DOS attacks hit these API dependencies, then you, you lost a, a connection to it. So these are things as engineers, this is what we get paid to do engineers to think through. And then availability, you got to think of more than just the DDoS. DDoS is, a, is a, um, one of the factors you have to think about when you're building highly reliable, highly resilient architectures. So if you're going to build something that's like, five nines, you got to think through a range of different things. And it's, it's surprising how many times people get upset. Like one time um, when I was in Indonesia and we're building up a, a 4G build out doing a 4G mobile network and all the vendors were getting upset with me because I was asking the basic question for all the different elements. If you get a surge load on this element in the network, right? How do you handle the surge? 
right? Are, do you have enough capacity to handle the surge? And those are two questions. How do you handle the surge? How do you do it? Now, surge load is like a DOS attack. So if a surge load happens like in a mobile network, you can lose a fiber link on your radio access network. So you have a million, two million customers down because the fiber got cut and the, resil the resiliency didn't work because you had a, a landslide and a flood and both fiber paths are cut. So now you got two million customers out. You fix the fiber and all of a sudden you have two million customers all connect at the same time. That's a surge. Um, you have the same sort of things when you go a popular new game, everybody's downloading a new game online or you have like, uh, oh, the new episode of Game of Thrones comes on, you know, and then HBO gets slammed with a surge load, right? Those are surge loads, all right? They're, they're, they're things that happen to the system you plan for it. And then people will look at me and go like, why? Why what should I plan for that? You know, those things won't happen. And that's when you run into problems and things fail, right? And surge load, DDoS load, similar sort of things. How do you handle all of a sudden a unexpected surge of traffic? And a DDoS is that sort of thing from an availability standpoint. So if you have problems if your boss is saying, I don't know if I need to worry about DDoS, well, tell them you need to worry about surge load. What happens if something, you know, you lose a link and all the customers come back up simultaneously, can your system handle that in a graceful way where the customers are not impacted, your customer experience? So that's um, aspects of it. And what's interesting about this, this concept of surge load was talked about back in 1969 by Paul Brand, who is kind of like our, our godfather of this whole resiliency model for IP engineering. And um, I'll send the link out uh, later on with this. I should have put the link into this slide uh, to go back and read this paper. Um, everybody who mentors with me, and I start teaching them uh, principles of engineer, IP engineering and resiliency engineering, and backbone design, I have them go back and read Paul Baran's original paper. Because it's so interesting, there's so many of the things we depend on today and we keep on redoing and redoing. It's like flipping a pancake. We keep on doing it over and over again. It's the same thing. It goes back to Paul Baran's original work. And um, if so many people are surprised when they look around and the new concepts they're learning, you know, they read Paul's uh, paper on this concept of having, building a highly reliable, highly resilient network architecture. They go like, well, it's interesting. And this was visualized back in 68, 69. So that's interesting with that. So back on DDoS, it's all about the packet. Um, I call it the law of the packet because on any device on here, cell phone or device or this computer or what we're doing over here over Zoom, you know, a packet goes out into the internet and always it has to be either delivered or it has to be dropped. If it's delivered, it takes energy. If it's dropped, it takes energy. Period. That's it. Right. And it's one of the things you gotta, you gotta remember that when people launch a DOS attack and throw in packets into the network, something is working to drop those packets or deliver those packets. Right. That's energy. That's energy on the system. That's load on the system. Right. That's load on queuing systems and things like that. Right. So when you got these systems, Overload, that's the key thing with, with, with it. And we have a whole bunch of different things you can do with the tools out there, these different widgets in the toolbox. But the other thing you got to remember with this is you can't do it as an afterthought. This is kind of like a diagram. It's an old diagram of an old architecture from the Cisco GSR architecture, right? Where you have a line card going to a route processor. A lot of routers are still using this sort of stuff. And what happens with this is you have to think through that as you go through the packet, the packets get processed in different places inside network elements. And so one of the things you know, I, I'm amazed about, and I noticed this in my own organization, I'll talk to network engineers and talk about, okay, which router do we have on this section of the network? Okay, uh, what's the internal architecture of this? How do, you, how do you manage this sort of stress? And they go, I don't know what the internal architecture is. And I go like, okay. Uh, I think we really need to figure that out, right? What is the internal architecture of this new box? Uh, I don't know offhand because, you know, I haven't worked in Cisco and Juniper for years, right? So I don't know the internal architecture, but they will teach you. They will teach you the internal architectures, right? Because you can't bolt on security as an afterthought. It's got to be built in. You got to know what it can and cannot do because a lot of packet, packet will go into a system and I could, I do, that's one of the things that attackers would do for DOS attacks. They will attack your routers. They will attack your switches, 
right? Um, don't get deceived with these easy reflector-based DOS attacks where they just throw lots of packets. There are many, many other DOS attacks out there that will go out there and instead of going through the data plane here, they'll go through the control plane or the um, uh, management plane and they overload systems that are not designed to handle huge amounts of packets per second. And then that will hit a network device in the middle of the network and, and take you out, right? So this is where you have these different mechanisms that get placed in, know what the mechanisms are and then turning them on. Like one of the things um, I was surprised about is I've talked to networks who are going through DOS, you know, these are big customers. And I would say, you know, how are you setting up your peer and routers? And these sort of concepts and principles, they go like, oh, I didn't know I needed to do that. I go, okay. Um, which is one of the reasons why we're resuscitating and investing off these programs. So we can go through this. So we're going to get more into this because even if you throw like big security stuff in there and you throw cues in there, you know, you got to know what we call um, the performance envelope of every piece of equipment you have in the network. So part of DDoS engine, uh, resiliency engineering, you can compare it to avionics. So when you fly an aircraft, um, your, that aircraft is not licensed to fly until you have what they call a performance envelope book, right? This is kind of like a, a booklet where you get a test pilot, take the aircraft up, and you take it through all the paces so you know exactly what the aircraft can do. And you have this the, the envelope of where here's the airspeed to land. Here's where you need to set the flaps to land. Here's the airspeed to take off. Here's where you set the flaps. Here's um, how much pitch you can do, raw, uh, yaw you can do. Here's the lift. Here's the descent. Here's the aircraft ceilings. Here's the sweet spots from the altitude perspective. Here's the max speed, right? Here's the, you know, the, all these different things are kind of figured out into a flight book, right? They're tested out of what you can do as, as an envelope of, you know, that capability of the piece of equipment. Every network device you have inside your network, you need to have the same sort of thing. Vendors will, well, some vendors who are the sales um, uh, representatives may go like, well, you're asking me hard questions. Ignore them, just keep on asking. So what is the envelope? What's the performance envelope? What's the packet per second capability? What's the packet per second capability if I have this many ACLs? What's the packet per second capability if I put on unicast RPF? What if I turn on ACLs, unicast RPF, and four other features? What if I did these features together? What can it do? What yeah, really ask the questions of what it can and cannot do. Now, it doesn't ding against that piece of equipment, right? Because that piece of equipment may be a really good piece of equipment for that part of the network, but you got to know what it can and cannot do. You don't want to find out in the middle of a stressful environment that you know it doesn't work like expected because you get these congestion points, right? So this is like an old slide with it where you get congestion points where you get like a lot of capability and then it will start, you know, attenuating and down as you get towards finally to the choke point. There'll be a choke point on there of where the um, uh, attacks happen. And you gotta also remember it happens in both directions. A lot of people, um, you know, forget, forget that sort of thing that you have to put it in both directions. So this gets into where in a DOS attack, there's a principle called the DOS aggregation point. And the DOS aggregation point is the place inside the, the path between where the attack is launched, right? Whether it's coming off of a reflector or a bot, right? To the target itself. So as you get closer and closer to the target, there'll be a point where stressing the network becomes really apparent, it becomes visible. Remember, visibility here, right? And where is that point? That's the DOS aggregation point where it all comes together from a distributed denial service attack. Um, and even if it's not a distributed denial service attack, it's just a plain DOS, like one, one flow from one device, you know, where is that DOS aggregation point? That DOS aggregation point, like somebody yesterday mentioned about uh, just doing a, a sin state flood against a server, right? That wasn't a volumetric but it was a state load. So the DOS aggregation point was on that device that it was targeted, right? So where this DOS aggregation point is important. Now, as we go through some of this, uh, go through a scenario here so you can understand, there's this um, model that we've been using for years for incident response where prepare, this is a part of the preparation stage. Um, we go through and when an attack happens, we identify. 
got to have the alerts to say, okay, something's going on. Then we classify what type of attack it is, what type of attacker could be, figure out where it's coming from so I can figure out how to respond. Then I react. Then I take through all my notes and I do my postmortem and I make the process better. And this, this step of going through preparation, identification, classification, traceback, reaction, and postmortem is kind of like has served the, the big network operators uh, quite effectively over the years as a response model. Um, and you can take this model and use this as part of your playbook. Here's what I need to do as, as part of my play, playbook reaction and have, um, you know, kind of like run, run, you know, what they call a run book. So here's my preparation run book. Here's my identification run book, you know, within each of these. So let's do a big pause for questions real uh, quick. I'm just going to stop sharing and let's see if there's anybody has any questions or anything they want to bring up before we get into the next section. You can drop them into the chat. Okay. So, and I just noticed one thing real quick is let's drop in because I think I shared them to Philip and didn't share it to the group <laughs> in the chat. So here's our sessions. So in the chat, I just dropped in the sessions so people have them. It's a good thing we paused and made sure everybody had the materials there. Yes, you only just sent it to me, Barry. You didn't share it to the group. But <laughs> bonuses well, are asked now. for them to be published on the website. So they should be there soon. Okay, all good. All right. Okay, so let's go ahead and share again. Share that one. Drop in a slideshow. All right, so let's do a, a, a hypothetical DOS attack. So um, here you are, situation normal, you know, um, having your coffee, you know, drinking your coffee or something. And all of a sudden, the alarms start going off. Something's happening in the network. All right, so here's here's my network. I'm I'm kind of like a target. I'm sitting on an ISP, or I am an ISP. Like I could be an ISP watching for DOS attacks across my network. All right, so you know, that one of my customers is taken out. So we'll put the role as a service provider. So one of my customers is being hit with a DOS attack and alarms are going off because it's causing problems in other parts of the network, right? So it's causing collateral damage. So collateral damage is the particular target is getting hit, but remember, where's the DOS aggregation point? So here the DOS aggregation point is within the pop serving that customer and all the other customers. So this could be like a section in a data uh, a colo facility or something that I'm serving, um, you know, my customers in there. Sorry, right? so I got collateral damage. So so this goes where you got to do something, and this is where you have an agreement with the particular customer who's targeted and others to actually go and do something, right? Because you got all these links overloaded, right? And this is impact on your SLA. You're going to get other customers calling you up. Right, so let's respond to it, right? So my network operations center or service fire says, okay, I got a customer impact with one of the DOS. It's impacting a number of customers. I got a collateral damage incident. So what's my big thing? Solve the collateral damage incident, right? <laughs> Keep focus on the problem, right? So what do I have in my toolkit? So I say in my toolkit, what I need to do is push the packet drop off the pop out to my edge, right? So I'll set up a IBGP advertisement to my black hole services, and that will push it out to a, a BGP update to all the routers on the edge of my network. And I have it, everything all pre-configured where now I push the drop to the target out. So what I need to do to do something like this, I gotta know who's being targeted, right? And they could have like, like a slash 24, but do I need to do the whole slash 24? No. If I have my NetFlow running on all ranges of my network, I can say, well, actually only this one, you know, dot 55 could be a web server is the one getting hit with the target. All right. So I don't need to do 
a slash 24, I can do a slash 32. Right, so this is one of the capabilities you can you can do with it, and where the visibility comes in with a play with it, because then the, then the target who is a customer of yours, your customer, is happier because you're not taking them offline, you're not completing their DDoS, you're just uh, putting up the slash thirty two of the particular service that's getting hit to give them some space to start figuring out what the next move will be after this. So, so now with the attack in progress, I got the attack pushed out and it's mitigated. It's not remediated, it's not taken care of, right? So now the customer has partial service, right? So, you know, their zone, their uh, IP address works within your backbone, right? And you push the attack off to the side, the attack is still active. So then you go through, say, what options, then you got your toolkit and you can do the next move. I can sinkhole it and watch it. I can um, go and push it upstream. I can activate a clean pipe solution and clear it up for a full, full service discovery. I've got these different options. So you can see this is where the playbook comes in. I get a scenario, collateral damage. I do this to actually clear up my links. And then I go through my next stage. I turn the page on my playbook and say, here's the next things I do. And some of that may be in relationship to what you're working on with the customer. Then you have to adjust with it because if you have a persistent attacker, they'll start rotating and shift. So the dance is in partnership. Your customer and your operations will work together as you're dancing with the miscreant as they're doing this attack. Because remember the attack can impact your infrastructure which impacts a whole range of your customers not just the customer under attack. So you, you go through and you say, okay, I'm going to use, you know, BGP communities to drop, which will we'll do some digression and talk a little bit more about, about, about those, all right? And so, you know, this is kind of like where you where you leave it, where you got the attack in progress, you've mitigated it, you got a partial service, you monitor until it gets back. The customer is trying to figure things out, or what they'll do is sometimes uh, an a old technique, which still works, is they'll rotate their, their service. So if, if the service was sitting on, um, the dot 55 address, they move it over to dot 155 and then they change their DNS over and they change all the pointers and then they change the service around. So then their customers are back in operation and then the cut, the attacker is still hitting dot 55 and it's being hit with the, the sinkhole, right? So, so I kind of leave it through there. So this is kind of like a, an example of, of what's going on. Now, sinkhole, we probably won't get to too much in this um, uh, tutorial um, segment in Apricot, but we got other sessions out there I'll point you to. What a sinkhole is, is instead of just dropping the packet, I redirect the packet. And we'll talk a little bit more about this as we talk about remote trigger black hole, because doing a redirect is kind of like a difference between how you do things in the service provider world and how you do things in, um, you know, just brute force putting a block up because I can maneuver the traffic around because I control the routing protocols. So when you when you are got access to your network and you can manipulate you know, routing protocols like border gateway protocol, you can manipulate the flow of the traffic. And here in this case, instead of having the packets flow and then stop and drop it, send it into the bit bucket. Instead, what I do is I redirect it out to a different interface, right? And, and then in the interface, I can connect it to a network and I can have a whole bunch of telemetry tools in there. And some of the big operators have really complicated, really um, uh, very well orchestrated sinkholes with honeypots in it and different scanners in there and different analysis and PCAP capture techniques and things like that. So you can actually see what's going on with the attack traffic with the sinkhole operations. So it can get quite uh, extensive. Some of them take the sinkhole operations and this is where they advertise their IP blocks from. So instead of doing the IP blocks, like if I have a, um, a slash 16, instead of putting a slash 16 on the routers, I put them in the sinkholes, they advertise out. And then all the IP address space that's not used is what we call dark IP address space. And then when people scan and look for it and poke at it, it goes into the sinkhole and you can count it. That's a, the segment here where they talk about dark IP login. And some of the big operators, that's uh, one of the techniques they use is they use it for dark IP login. All right, so, so that's the, the so this is kind of like where, where we're at now. So now we're, 
we're out there. And then the next stage in there says, okay, from going from partial service, the TAC is still going, I'm going to do a full service recovery and move it off to a clean pipe solution. And clean pipe solution is why I send it off to a scrubber, uh, a scrubbing service or scrubbing capability, whether it's on your network or off your network, because they work um, on your network into cloud and on the edge is, is kind of like where you put your, your full service recoveries. So the key thing to remember here is partial service recovery is when I'm pushing my block out. Full service recovery is when you focus on having some sort of capability where you're able to like filter out the attack profile and clean it up and then write out the attack. So you're having enough capacity to write out the attack and then filter it out at the same time. All right, and that's your scrubbing capability with full service stuff. So uh, pause for questions. Anybody with questions? Okay, as you think of the questions, drop them into the chat. Love to get the questions from people. And let me just uh, make a quick adjustment here and we'll move on to the next section. All right, so next section, what is our toolkit? Um, there's some basic tools that I push uh, um, and others push all the time. These tools um, are really, really critical. Um, we'll be expanding as we revise these materials because this is the first part of a, a multi-month revision of the whole DDoS resiliency workshop materials. So, you know, come back in a couple of months, um, you know, um, if you follow me on LinkedIn, you'll see the announcements, you know, I'll ask the the apricot and AP Nick to announce it too. And we do the next round of like, like maybe weekly uh, workshop updates. So we get updates of these materials, but this is kind of like the old core stuff. These 12 areas where you prepare your knock, set up your mitigation communities, um, you know, get some sort of communication channel system out there, point protection, edge protection, remote trigger black hole filter and sinkholes, storage assertive validation, protect your control plane, that's our BGP security put it all, a whole bunch of data, data visibility, get in the habit of cleaning up your network, you know, what we call network hygiene, you know, getting the report from shadow server and things like that, and then turn your DNS resolver into a security tool, all right? So these are kind of like the core ones and they apply to all sorts of networks out there. Um, again, this, you know, prepare your knock, have a playbook, have a methodology, have a system, right? Don't let uh, the your network operations center. Notice I'm saying network operations center, not security operations center. You could be lucky enough to have a security operations center, but what we find with a DOS attack is that's usually a knock role versus a SOC role, because a SOC is usually the investigative side. They're looking for like you know, and they would assist the, the knock. But when it comes to reacting to keep your network and your services up and running, it's usually a network operations center, right? Uh, so that's kind of like one of the things that be mindful of is you, you can't have the knock say, oh, that's the SOC's job. The SOC's job is response to DDoS. And then the SOC, I've been in a situation that then the SOC says, they don't allow me to touch the routers. I can't do a remote trigger block hole. How do I stop a DOS attack? Then they point fingers at us because we're not stopping a DOS attack. What do we do, right? So this is, uh, uh, you know, anything like this where it's affecting network and services is a, is a knock role. Um, I'm going to do a big update on how we plug into communities. This is kind of like, there's a whole bunch of different security communities out there that you can plug into. Um, and it's changed over the years, it's evolved over the years. So this is like a module we'll do later on this week on how do we plug into different communities so you're, you're, you're tapped into what's happening and uh, you're not dependent on paid security data, right? There's so much out there where uh, you can, you don't need to pay to get valuable security insights, right? Um, and so this is kind of like tapping into how you do that. And also how do you evolve those relationships so you can pick up the phone and call somebody and say, hey, I need some help. Um, because that's the number one, you know, uh, mitigation tool out there is, is calling for help out there. And this goes into setting up these, these direct and out of band channels out there. A really old system that kind of really validated this, this is no longer in, in uh, operations, was the INOC DBA system, which was a, a VoIP system that worked even during DOS attacks, right? And like um, SQL Slammer in 2003 is one of the first times we actually used INOC DBA in, in, as an operational crisis. It worked really, really nice on, on setting up the system to take care of things. 
But these days, um, we get Slack and the service provider community protects Slack because so much of the stuff that we, for operational stuff arrives on Slack and Signal and WhatsApp, you know, you just have multiple channels of communication so you can say, here's how to do it. Uh, a colleague of mine is using Starlink, right? Because we got the satellite systems going. Um, so, you know, it's it kind of like, you know, move, moves around and add, adds into it. Um, really quick, we got some questions. Uh, Jerome asks, based on your experience, how are the major operators working on the anti-DDoS hybrid? Is it more of a single vendor hybrid solution or multi-vendor, which is most cost-effective? And then um, online scrubbing, extra latency. So we'll, we'll get to those in a few minutes. Both the, Jerome's question and Mon's questions, good, good questions there. So thanks for asking them. So let's continue on the toolkit real quick. Uh, point protection. So point protection, we're gonna do a breakout module with uh, uh, tomorrow because um, just like yesterday, we started with a security advisory from a, uh, a, one of the national security groups. Um, we're gonna do another one on point protection because, um, and it's amazing how, just how much um, of the industry is not doing some of the basic things that you know, is really old of how do you actually protect the devices on your network and protect your infrastructure on your network. Simple things like um, every router on the edge of my network, whether it's a internet facing edge or customer facing edge should have an anti spoof filter on. That means that any packet coming in should not be equal, should not have the source address of any of my infrastructure address blocks, All right? And we'll explain that because if you're allowed to do that, you can do all sorts of nastiness on your network infrastructure. There's all sorts of things. If you can get a spoofed source equal to your backbone IP address links, there's a whole bunch of things you can do to take out those backbone links without a lot of packet flow, right? And so when I found that out, when I was looking at some of the spoofer data, which we'll talk about in the next session, you know, that was a real shocker, right? Um, Add to that infrastructure ACLs, right? Infrastructure ACLs has that in there. And infrastructure ACLs and exploitable port filtering, you know, are, are critical elements of actually how you protect the network and they work, they really work. And as an example of that, like the infrastructure ACL is one of the ways you put the anti-spoof. So anti-spoof to your own organization, anti-bogon, if there's addresses that are not yet been um, um, advertised or should never be advertised on the network, your infrastructure address blocks, then you do explicit denies on uh, uh, layer three, lower four packets, and then you have your incident reaction. Then you have, you know, so you deny, then you do a permit, and then everything else in audited, right? So this is kind of like a, uh, a hybrid ACL design that uh, most of the big operators who deploy these out there, right? And the explicit deny L L3, L4 is where you're, what we call the ex uh, exploitable port filtering. And you can view this as a number of shields, right? And you notice the shields are in both directions because one of the things we found out with the spoofer data work, which we'll talk about in the in, uh, uh, BCP38 session next, is that you got to do packets coming in, packets going out, right? So you do it in both directions, right? Some people that say, I just need to do it from outside in and they're not doing it from inside out, right? And it's both directions, which are, which are really, really, uh, critical with it. Uh, to get some experience, the ideas around this, um, we'll put this out there as a link during the break uh, to go to this page. So what we did um, is we worked with the big operators after NoPetra and WannaCry, because what we saw with NoPetra and WannaCry worm incidents, that those operators who did this technique put a modified infrastructure access list and made it an exploitable port filter in and took a whole bunch of address blocks that, um, or ports and filtered them out, right? Because they just shouldn't be on the internet um, and they cause mischief, right? And you document it in a certain way so your customers know, right? So it's all transparent. This is what we're doing on the network, right? And what some people say is, oh, my routers won't support it, bull. <laughs> Modern routers will support these ACLs quite effectively, right? Uh, so you can't use that as an excuse. That may have worked in 1999, but it doesn't work today, right? They, 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 they work with it. 
other tool in your toolkit, remote trigger black hole. We'll talk a bit more about this, this one, um, you know, with remote trigger black hole. This right here is our number one tool for stopping DDoS today. There's remote trigger black holes happening as we speak all the time, over and over and over again in various forms. Um, and you'll see why when, uh, in a few, few slides from now. Sinkholes is sections in the network, as I mentioned, that we set up so you can actually, instead of dropping the packets, I move them over to an area so I can measure what's going on, right? So that's what I'm doing with the sinkholes with it. Um, source address validation, BCP38, powerful tool. We need to get more and more of it out there. We'll talk about that. We have a whole module in the second hour today with it. BGP prefix filtering. Um, this is going to be a section I'll, I'll do later on this week on the BGP security. And we have another uh, tutorial on BGP security. Um, so this is really, really critical. But the basics of the BGP prefix filtering. And then the RPKI and everything else we're doing for doing BGP security. You know, you got to take care of the routing protocol. It's BGP with it. And there's we got talks on that in Apricot, a couple of more talks that talk about this whole area in there. Um, total visibility, lots and lots of NetFlow, lots of lots of uh, API statistics, a lot of counters, logging all over the place. This is kind of like, you know, really critical to kind of see what's happening. We got to have the total visibility with it so you can see the spikes and things like that without. And then you got to clean up your network. Um, yesterday, I mentioned, mentioned it again. Shadow Server, get their daily uh, reports from Shadow Server, and the daily reports from Shadow Server will, will give you uh, valuable information on what's happening in the network with what customers are actually infected. You know, And that's super valuable to ISPs, and they use that to actually clean up the network and contact customers. Now, granted, some of it is hard. When you call up a dental office, you're trying to say, why do you have that LDAP service, LDAP server sitting on your network? That dental office is going to go, what's an LDAP? Right, so sometimes remediating this is 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 a, is a hard task, but this is you know there's a rhythm to it, and there's you know if you just keep at it, you get to cl uh, clean up with it. So there's a there's kind of like a toolkit. These are the core toolkit that you go back and back back for, back to all the time, and then you get variations of it. So before I get to the the questions part that we we have on it, let's just talk about the evolution of the number one tool, the remote trigger black hole. So there's a, a pointer to slides I'll send out to everybody, which is kind of like an old presentation on how the mechanics of the remote trigger black hole works. It's, it's important to understand why this technique worked. This technique um, evolved from in the 90s when we were looking at how do you stop DOS attacks and access list didn't really work. I mean, yes, there was a period where routers access lists were horrible, right? And what we needed to do instead of putting access lists on, we needed to shunt them. We needed to route them. Um, the the my first DOS attack, I was under, you know, hit by another country. I was running a military network, and the uh, it was a Cisco AGS plus. And what we came up with was taking a, and, and all of you here are probably too young to remember, but it was a. AUI thick net transceiver to a ethernet transceiver. So AUI was a thick net transceiver, it was a type of cable, all right? And then doing a, a connector to a coax ethernet, right? This is long before RJ45 was ever envisioned. It had a coax e e ethernet and we'll put two T connectors on it. So you connected that to the router, right? And you did a, a spoof ARP to that interface, right? And uh, you know, so it looked like it was a live Ethernet switch. And then what we would do is we would route the packets out that interface. And you just had a T connector with two terminators on it. And then the packets will go route out that interface and it will, it will drop, right? And so that's that was like the first of this, you know, evolution of it. It was the first BGP shunt, uh, those sort of techniques. And that was like early 90s. Since then, we started using um, border gateway protocol. Border gateway protocol allowed us to do this where we actually can push the things out. So the old days of saying like, help, I'm being attacked, and you put an access list on, you know, shift it around where I can actually push out with BGP and do a remote trigger black hole to my edge of my network, and then ask my service provider to do it on their edge of the network. So you push the slash 32 out 
to the edge. So you get away from the DOS aggregation point. So think of the DOS aggregation point as hitting that enterprise data center. And if I push it out to the service provider, I push it back where the packet load isn't as much. I've, I've moved, I've shifted the DOS aggregation point where it's, it's not causing the damage, but I'm able to drop it, right? So then um, we looked at it and then you had source space from what Trigger Black called. So we, we found out that with Unicast RPF, you can actually run it in ASIC. And if you run it in ASIC or your network processor, or FPGA, you can actually drop based off of sources if you actually did a little, a few little tricks. So the presentation I'll point you to with the tricks out there, you can actually uh, drop based off of the source address. So now, and, and that's what we created with the Unicast RPF loose check. Some people were saying Unicast RPF loose check was created so you can have asymmetric routing. That's wrong. That's not why it was created. As key instigator pushing it out there, Unicast RPF loose mode was created specifically so we can do a source space remote trigger black hole. It was a DDoS response technique. Um, that was why it was created, you know, and, and why it was pushed out in the industry. So that then evolved. Can I push out an ACL? And because BGP had these extendable properties in it, we can actually stick ACL information in the BGP traffic, and then you actually take it, take that information of flow specification, and you use that to actually apply an ACL, right? So that becomes the next evolution where you have the flow spec capability with it, right? And then you can mitigate with flow spec. So instead of doing a phone call, and you can do inter-provider sort of capability. So in other words, you can go hop by hop by hop and move it up. All right, then you can also scrub it. You can do, use the same techniques instead of doing um, a um, drop the packet, I shunt the packet, I redirect the packet, right? And so this is where we get into starting to apply, sending the packets instead of dropping it, I send it instead of sending it to a sinkhole, I send it to a scrubbing center. And then the scrubbing center is set up where I'm using GRE or LTTPV3 or a VRF or MPLS, you know, and send it back to the actual, uh, you know, location who, who you're setting up the scrubbing service with, right? So, so you know, and it can be initiated throughout there. So very early on, um, DDoS, you know, started getting coordinated. People would get on the phone with each other and coordinate and push and, push and uh, drops all the way out to the edge of the network, right? Using everybody's doing remote trigger black hole within their network. So this spurred a couple of ideas, right? So there's a couple of ideas of where this has evolved to. One idea evolved over the years where it say, okay, let's make it standardized. Let's set up communities. And then even to the extent where you can say, if I am a customer, like if I am a customer of NTT, right? Or I'm connected to Equinix, right? Um, at, a, at a parent point, I can actually send them a community. I can send NTT um, and say, I need this black hole. I need to have NTT do a remote trigger black hole on my behalf. So I send, here's the slash 32, and you set this up. You have an agreement. I have an agreement with NTT that I can send a slash 32. They're going to filter on, on their side. So that slash 32 will be stopped inside the network. But then I can go through and say 65009-2914, that community, and then it gets dropped on their edge. So I can go from my edge to their edge, right? Same thing with Equinix. So this is all documented in, in the principles and RS, it, it evolved over the years. You know, it was kind of like scattered and then we coordinated and then we got RFC 7999, which is the black hole community's uh, principles with it. So this is kind of like where we are now. If you don't have this set up in your operations, talk to each of your upstream operators because this is now a common practice to do these sort of things. So you can, you're, you can take it, do a black hole for your customer, and then you go upstream to the next one up, right? So you can you can get two autonomous systems deep into the organization uh, easily with a quick phone call, uh, stuff like that. Um, so other ways of mitigating the attack, scrubbing centers, push out with scrubbing centers in the cloud, and then you push everything out to the edge. And I'll talk a little bit more about this when we talk about the science of DDoS, about the different ways of doing it with send it through scrub, 
and uh, send it through the web practices, right? But the key thing with all this is log in to make sure you have your source addresses. The source address uh, list of who's attacking you is really important, even if they're spoofed, right? Because as I mentioned yesterday, um, if the attacker has got telemetry, in other words, they're measuring the effectiveness of the attack, some of those spoofed addresses are not spoofed. They're valid addresses. So you need to collect them so you can find out which ones are um, spoofed and which ones are telemetry addresses, right? And so you can do things with those, those uh, uh, cleanup with it. Now, extending the community effort, we have utters, right? And there'll be a lightning talk next week where um, uh, James uh, is from Team Comrie is gonna talk about the evolution of utters. Because others has moved from version one, which is remote trigger black hole destination based to version two, we should actually push out flow spec. This is also another tool in your toolkit, right? So notice with all these, it's like, get the tool configured, get it deployed, get it ready to go. It's in your toolbox. And then you have your playbook to say when you use it and don't use it. So in the others context here, I have a whole network, right? Of across the internet, many different autonomous systems. And so you would have a DOS attack going on, right? And what the Otter service does <coughs> is it act as a coordinator. So instead of you trying to do all these relationships, right, you can send a remote trigger black hole, you know, one AS up, right, to your autonomous system, and they can maybe do one more, right? But it gets very tedious when you do that. So the alternative is you go to Otters and you say, okay, let's have them push it out. And now you have the drops happening internet wide, right? So it becomes a tool with the toolkit. Now, the drops are happening close to the edge. Remember, partial service recovery versus full service recovery, right? This is not a full service DOS cleanup service. It's not a scrubbing service. This is just a tool where it says, okay, I'm gonna be able to push this out to the edge as far out to give me the breathing space to work the attack. Right. And so that's what others does with it. Now, we keep on doing community work. Uh, CenturyLake and AT&T uh, worked hard. They, they did the whole uh, proof of concept. They kind of have it still in place where they created a, a flow spec coordinator for backbone protection. In other words, what if somebody went after the backbone links? Right. And if you're interested in this, you can watch the presentation that they have. And, you know, there are people at, um, now, instead of CenturyLink uh, uh, at uh, Cox was involved with it and um, Charter was involved with it. So uh, Charter and, and AT&T, you know, they would be interested in like, if, you're, if you wanna participate and play around with the experiment. But the idea here is how do you protect the backbone links during like a cyber war <laughs> as an example, right? So uh, that's one of the things on there. There are other ideas that were tried for DDoS work. Um, TIDP TMS, Right, uh, the threat information distribution protocol was something that was tried inside Cisco. It didn't go like people thought it would could go, right? But that it kept on living a life. It's you know resuscitated, and it was funny because um, what dots is dots is basically what was going on with TIDP, except internet wide in IETF. So um, you know this uh, you can build these now anti federations with with the work out of that. And I think uh, we'll do another session um, just on dots and the capability of dots in one of the uh, after apricot modules uh, extensions with that, All right? So that's you know a rough get a rough uh, walk through with the different tools for for um, how um, our toolbox for handling DDoS uh, would be for especially for a backbone provider. So now the circle around. Um, with the, uh, two questions that were uh, put into the chat. So um, what are the big major operators? What's their uh, anti-DDoS hybrid solutions and things like that? So when you look at it, you take a typical big backbone in the United States or in uh, a big backbone like in Asia, like in, uh, take like NTT. Um, DOS against their infrastructure is very much a um, destination-based remote trigger black coal, BGP shunts, source-based RTBH um, flow spec. In other words, they don't need to go through scrubs because what they do is they actually need to protect their backbone infrastructure, right? So they use, their operations team will use the appropriate tool within the toolbox with it. 
the scrub and service is a service they actually build out to provide for their customers, right? So they can use the tools in the toolbox that does partial service, but the scrub and service, they'll, you know, those are things that, you know, it's make revenue off of it. And the reason why you want to put revenue against that is because you got to constantly upgrade it. A remote trigger black hole is something that's built into the router. Flow spec is built into the router. Uh, sinkholes, if you shunt it to a sinkhole, those that's usually spare equipment, uh, second generation equipment, not the current equipment you got deployed. You take the equipment you used to have deployed and you use it in the sinkhole, right? So, so when you look at the, the uh, operational expense for scaling on the toolkit for those tools, there isn't a there isn't a, a, a you know a scaling cost with it. It just comes with how you scale out your network. But then when you look at like a scrubbing service, um, when you're doing a full service recovery, that needs to be upgraded. It needs to keep up with the different DOS attacks. If you remember yesterday's session, you know like the the chart that um, Damian Mentor from Google shared, you know it shows the DOS attacks continue to increase the volumetric part. So if you're going to do a, a, a scrub and service, a full service DDoS recovery service, you got to be able to scale that. That means you got to have revenue attached, right? So now if you're doing that and you sell it to the customers, you can also use that for operations to help protect yourself. But you, you, know, you, you do that by selling to your customers. So Jerome, that's kind of like the key thing that they do with it. Now, you know, um, a lot of the network infrastructure is multi-vendor. You know, you know, operators out there, they don't, you know, rarely do you see like single vendor, the entire backbone, everything. So it's multi-vendor. That's why a lot of these techniques, we specifically, as we evolved them in the community, we made sure they weren't patented. Now, of course, what's interesting, if you look for patents on your remote, remote trigger black hole, you'll find <laughs> network operators like See, uh, Verizon put a patent on remote trigger black hole and AT&T put a patent on remote trigger black hole, but they're like nonsense patents because, you know, they just, they, they were, this is like six years after remote trigger black hole was actually created and some engineer, you know, put it in and nobody did the due diligence to find out, oh, this, it's already prior art and it's already out there. Um, but we intentionally did these things like flow spec multi-vendor right? So that way many people can, can, you know, multiple vendors can do it and you can have a multi-vendor solution in your network. So, um, and it's pretty efficient with that. Um, Monin asks, online scrubbing is, is having extra latency and getting to slow down traffic as an ISP customer complains when traffic comes to the scrub, any optimization ideas? Um, so the, there's, there's go, you're going to incur latency as you go through a scrub, right? Because you're going to redirect, which means you add extra hops. So you're going to have just latency by redirecting it. You know, I redirected to a scrubbing center in my ISP and that incurred four more hops. Um, so that it has a, a, a problem with it. Um, then you got to go through the packet delay as it goes through the, the scrubbing device, right? And it's not scrubs for DDoS isn't just a simple access list. It's a layered approach. You got, you got um, uh, anti-spoof filters, you got explicit filters, you got profile filters, and you got flow telemetry filters, right? So you got these layers of filters that you put into a scrub uh, capability and that's incurs latency. So as you go through cycle with it. So you will go, you will incur latency with it. And that's why a lot of times what happens is you have a route on, route off. Right, you say, okay, I need the service. I'm going to route on. Now, you know, you do that so you can actually mitigate it out there. So, so getting a, you're going to have it's going to slow down traffic, right? It's something to set up with the customer so they understand. I'm getting attacked. I'm going to incur extra latency. That's just the nature of the game. The best way to walk through that, if you're if you are providing a service to your customers and your customers providing giving you complaints with it, is make sure as part of the service you sell, you have a nice solid playbook methodology. So when you set them up as a, you know, as a DOS service, you say part of the, the onboarding is you say, here's our playbook. Here's our standard playbook that we use. Here's all the instructions of how to use the service. Here's what to expect out of the service. And let's go test it. Let's not wait for the incident, let's test it. So everybody understands 
here's what will happen when you start using this service to actually clean up a DOS attack and keep your, your, your business up and running. So having that playbook and having QoS within it is, is um, what I found as ways of setting those expectations properly with the uh, extra performance things. Um, Jerome, thanks for the next question, which was, how would the flow spec be extended or agreed upon agreed upon operators? Should this be like a, a IX like approach? Um, I think you just talk to your peers with it. Um, one of the things that I was looking at uh, earlier today, I was looking at some of the uh, exchange points and some of the others doing what they call advanced um, DDoS black hole and it's basically flow spec, right? So you can set things up with it. As you, as you see with others 2.0 doing flow spec specifications, um, you got the BGP rules and BGP peering, you know, is, is a matter of guarded, what it, we teach is guarded trust. In other words, you set up filters on your side of what you're gonna send and what you will receive. And then the other part of your peer is gonna set up filters of what they, will receive and what they will send, right? So it's guarded trust. So you have these filters on both sides of the BGP peering connection. And when you set that up for flow spec for security, it's doing the same thing. Here's the things I accept, here's the things I don't accept. And then when you write your flow spec rule on like a Cisco or a Juniper router, um, you set up the parameters and say, here's how much ACL space I do, right? So that way you don't blow up your ASIC or your TCAM or something like that because too much flow spec uh, um, ask, you know, instructions got through with it. And um, you define them in. What they did, and it, this is an open source tool that uh, Charter did with the Charter at and experiment with the DOS parent part, is that tool is still out there, right? So some people have actually used that tool, which is open source, of instead of peering with each other, they peer with a box. And the box has additional rules to make sure they have a human to check on it. And so when there's a flow spec ask, people could look at it and say, yes, that's okay. Okay, push it out to my network. So um, that's, a, that's a good question. Okay, any other questions before we take a break? Uh, and Jerome says, my only concern is in-house scrubbing is that if you have a limited international capacity, it's always a burden to allow to tack up to your premise operator. So I suppose motor about, oh yeah, yeah. So, so what you're talking about there, Jerome, is um, uh, when you have limited international capacity, right? Your choke point is that international capacity, all right? So things like remote trigger black hole, where you push it on the other side of the international link, is great. That's one of the things you want to have set up where you can have that option to, to push the drops off your network. So like if you are a service provider on a Pacific Island and you got a link over a terrestrial link and you don't want that DOS attack coming into the island, you want to actually push the drop to the router on the other side. And the router on the other side, um, old school was that be your router. In other words, you get a, a cage in a colo center and in one of the data centers and you know uh closer to like you know australia or united states or someplace or singapore or something like that right um but then the other thing with uh you can do today is is coordinate that with the operator that you get connected to and you can send a remote trigger black hole to their device so so yes um that's one of the things to have in your playbook you get a dos attack step one collateral damage is over the international link get the DOS attack off the international link. All right, so that's <clears throat> something to add to your playbook. Okay, so we're going to stop the recording and take a break. And